blockchain is great for, for verifying transactions, but you have to understand, you know, do you need a blockchain? How do I use a blockchain? And then also um, understanding what consensus mechanism you want to use. I think that very important that on the private side, because you're dealing with business partners, you have a variety of options. So proof of authority, proof of, uh, uh, let's see, Quorum uses a POS, uh, no, proof of authority, I think another one is, um, uh, there's, there's a ton of private ones, but again, you're not mining for uh, the transactions. So I think at the end of the day, my biggest thing with blockchains, they're great for securing and verifying transactions, but blockchains are not inherently secure because they're sitting on Web 2.0 infrastructure and that's completely insecure. Um, that on too. Yeah, I think the question is quite broad. Uh, there are a lot of uh, securities. So basically what you have talk, uh, talking about, uh, so, like it involves some consensus algorithm securities, like uh, what kind of consensus algorithm is the, is the best to prevent 51% attack. Uh, there is also private key management securities, smart contract securities, um, and also there's a new, uh, new trend I've seen uh, among all the new projects that, so some projects like Nervos, they extract the smart contract engine running level out and uh, build a distributed network like a layer two network on top of a major ecosystem and uh, how do you how do they like guarantee the two networks are talking to each other and verify, verify, verify the transaction is another topic. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot to talk about, but I'll talk about the smart contract uh, security later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so I guess those are all three summaries. But I think what's interesting to note is that oftentimes people talk about the power consumption of the Bitcoin network as a, as a waste. But truly it's done to preserve these aspects of security and to preserve a level of decentralization. And so I think it's a bit of a misconstruction to call it as a complete waste of energy. And if we think about it's comparable in the fiat systems, how much energy it takes to keep paper money going around, I think we'll find that it's more efficient. And um, I, I guess the more security oriented fact that I thought was interesting when I was first learning about the space was about how cryptography, everything is kind of secure until it's proven not to be. Like you have a tough time mathematically preventing um, collisions, but there's a bit of a law that says like how long something has lasted so far is a good prediction for how long it will last in the future. So I always thought that was a little interesting. Well, we have a saying, um, the engineers, we have a saying that blockchain is this goofy little dance that a computer has to do <coughs> in order to replicate a human condition. Was that going to demonstrate? Suppose it's like 500 years ago and we're at market and I have my chickens, he has his goats. Now we want to trade chickens for goats. Shake my hand. Hold his hand, he holds mine. I put my chickens down, he puts his goat down. The goat's fine, he thinks the chickens are good. We release hands so that he doesn't run away with the goat and the chicken. All of you saw that, correct? So you have a consensus that that took place. It will be very difficult for him socially to retract that agreement. Okay, so we can't lose track of the physical state that that blockchain is replicating. We need to secure that, we need to maintain that. That social consensus is as important as that digital consensus. If you don't have the social consensus, you don't have the digital consensus. And one example would be securitization of assets. A bank has an asset. There's collateral under that asset. If the collateral gets divorced from the security, the security disappears. That's what happened in the financial crisis of 2007 in the United States. <coughs> so the integrated engineering uh, blockchain consortium are the mechanical, electrical, civil engineers who manage the electricity, your infrastructure, your roads, bridges, highways, hospitals. We are going to integrate ourselves and provide these oracle services at the physical state to validate these smart contracts. So that's, we think the entire ecosystem needs to be secure. And they're doing a fantastic job on the digital side. We have to do a lot better on the physical side because that's where the attack vectors are. Thank you. So um, just based on what you said, I think uh, blockchain is, you know, it is infrastructure design and also like they have addition, like for example, smart contract, and also they have a general uh, public and private case. So they are, they are all like very uh, important uh, character security 
a characteristic of the blockchain. Um, however, when we uh, look back to the uh, uh, history, we still see like um, in blockchain world, there are lots of lots of uh, security happening every day. So when we go back to 2016, the DAO was hacked, right? And uh, and last year, we see um, parity wa uh, wallet uh, with a multi signature. They have problems. Uh, until recent now, I see lots of projects, and uh, they are just developing uh, over Ethereum. So they are ERC20. So they have uh, lots of uh, issues with the smart contract uh, back code. So uh, hackers just use a uh, you know language to to hack to to get the money out. Um, lots of uh, exchanges like Bitstamp, like in Korea, the private key was stolen uh, just uh, two weeks ago. So um, I see lots of uh, 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 things happen. And, uh, I, I can find like almost like 80, uh, 90 percent of the issues was caused by uh, the smart contract security and also the private key security. Um, do you mind? I, so I think it, it will be a very uh, interesting uh, topic to, uh, to discuss about. So, um, any anyone anyone want to share? Because I, I have a Ricardo, you have a, a project C block to use a private key security. You use the Intel SGS to do that problem. Yeah, or any yeah. No, only yeah. I mean, I think it's the, the biggest issue. I mean, when it comes to the unique security risk that blockchain provides are uh, the, the smart contract security. That's the problem is, is that you have you know millions of developers that are now now we have I think half a million developers that have learned uh, Solidity, the programming language for smart contracts in Ethereum, and then Hyperledger, which is uh, chain code, which is the the, the contract, smart contract language for Hyperledger. And so you have people getting into the field, but you're you're assuming that these people know how to write good code. You know, and I have a friend of mine that has a, a skills called Skillstack, uh, and he he sits there and trains children on uh, how to write, uh, you know, learn Java C. And one of his big things is that it's the math. It's you know having good quality code uh, is hard because like, I worked at uh, this big red company for for many years, and I tell you, that not every coder is the same. They're not all created equal, and so uh, companies like this one we call, we saw here today, uh, the guy that's there, that, that one. Any smart contract auditing company uh, or security company, those are, there's a Quantstamp, uh, Zeppelin, and this company, those are other good investments because you know you cannot trust, uh, I guess again, I'm not saying I don't trust anybody, but when it comes to the smart contracts, for example, that we're building, you know, I'm gonna pay for the best audit service so I know that these contracts have good quality code. All right, and it isn't just some repo that's on GitHub that somebody threw some code together because they used to be a good Java program and they learned Solidity. And so, you know, so having good and doing good code is one thing, but also what are your security software development best practices? That's the other one. You know, working at Oracle taught me the importance of having good starting off with security first and having good software development practice around building that. The same methodologies that the CF, CSO for Oracle applied on all of the development teams is the same kind of uh, best practice that you need for developing smart contracts. You know, you can't just hire some Ethereum kid and says, hey, I, do, I know Ethereum now. I mean, there's no way because, like you said, it was next. I think it's even higher. I mean, the, when it comes to the percentage Nine of all the hacks, at least higher. I mean, of all the hacks that have happened, they're stealing keys and they're busting through code. So I either hacked the server and got to the keys, or in these cases, like the DAO was just bad Ethereum code. Right, and, yeah. and every single time it's a smart contract. They have a repository problem. Yeah, I have zero trust in, in all the smart contracts are developed. You know, they said a million now, but you need companies, any auditing company. So, again, if you're an investor or if you're a VC or, or you know, you need to have these kind of, like any service company, say, audit my smart contracts before we go live and put it permanently. And not because once it's on the Ethereum blockchain, for example, it's there. You're done. You have to go and redo it. And, you don't want to spend that kind of money. Yeah, I agree with Ricardo. So I'll speak to the uh, parity multi-sig wallet attack uh, last year specifically. So it, it was attacked twice. So last year, only only six months in between. That totally broke my heart because uh, my 50% of my assets in ETH and uh, uh, you know broke the trust of the public. 
Uh, yeah, the first one, uh, $30 million was stolen, uh, happened in mid-July, and uh, the, the second one, November, uh, $150 million was a lot. So when I look at the code, so when I'm looking back, when I look at the smart contract code, it was just bad. It, it was an immature uh, programming code. So I used to work at Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft, like, even a like, two-year Microsoft engineer of the totally uh, I would say 99% avoid the, the, the mistake like the, the code. So basically they forgot to uh, uh, specify the access, the default access, uh, uh, the keyword like public or private on the innate wallet call, which is a constructor call, a constructor call, very critical to the, uh, to the multi-sig wallet creation. Um, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going into the uh, technical details of the uh, multi-sig wallet hack, but uh, like speaking from high level, first the, the code is immature, and second there was little, very little precaution uh, was taken to audit the code. So I read their post mortem of that uh, mid July incident, uh, incident from uh, Parity. Uh, they were like, okay, this bug was among like a very large change, and only one round of auditing has been done, and it was a UI audit. So the guy have no idea like what's what's really in the smart contract, like what's changing in smart contract, and the expert has totally missed it. That's that's how it happened. That's the second thing, and the third thing is we definitely need automatic testing in this area, like the uh, 30k, um, so formal verification stuff like that. Um, so that's my take on the <coughs> stuff in the smart contract. Yeah, it's interesting to know with the with the parity multi say wallet scenario. That was a very competent team, at least one that was considered competent until then. Um, so if someone like them could still have such a blunder, it's unclear as to how much an auditing firm really can do. Ethereum took an interesting bet by modeling their solidity off JavaScript to make it accessible and easy to deploy upon. But the contrast was they sacrificed stuff like security, which is interesting. Uh, Tezos, for example, it's tougher to build a smart contract but it has higher promises of security. So right now it's probably too early to tell which models will succeed, but you can see them trying to backtrack and maybe from this problem. So we'll see what that is. So that begs the question, who audits the auditors? In, um, in engineering, you don't know who's, who's designed. And typically in engineering, uh, an engineer will have another engineer check their work. And this is called a claim and a validation. And things do not go forward without a claim and a validation at all points. Um, you can corrupt an engineer, you can corrupt an, uh, an inspector, you can do all that, but if you decentralize body of engineers, then you don't know which engineer is going to come and inspect that code or inspect that building or inspect anything. And they don't know who exactly they're inspecting because they can seek corruption. Then you eliminate those tendencies or, the, or you start reducing the likelihood. You can't solve these problems individually, but you can always reduce the likelihood until it becomes economically too expensive to attack. So this is one of the things uh, that, that we're looking at. And specifically in construction, the tokens that we use, we set up a game. It's a simple game that engineers play that generates tokens which, which changes the incentives. The value of those tokens are intrinsic to the infrastructure that the engineers create. So they have intrinsic value, which is novel. But that's the thing that keeps the game going and that keeps the changes the incentives that are required in order to get to a state where we can now be assured that that code is being done by the right person um, at, the, at the high probability that they can't be corrupted or that they're competent. Yeah, agreed. Definitely, you know, except for what we mentioned, like smart contract, you know, so uh, private key, it also has a lot of security uh, among the blockchain ecosystem. We have the, you know, even for the token, as a, you know, token economy model, it's also a security way, you know, to make the maintain, to make, uh, to maintain the whole ecosystem to be secure, to be stable, and uh, uh, running, yes. And also, I want to add more, uh, kind of, so uh, as uh, you mentioned for the uh, formal uh, verification one, so I think um, I just checked uh, there are lots of uh, attacks to the smart contract. So I can find actually some mistake can be done by unit tasks. So I think why the people, why the developer didn't find a, a mistake when they do the code, it must be there is a large discrepancy between the, before, uh, between the different uh, between the level of developers. So I think 
Um, that's also the you know the mention point we should focus on the industry. We're looking for great developers to join our blockchain world. But it's still not. I mean, what, <clears throat> what I'm sorry. Cool. I'm what he said was was true. I mean, the parity team is great, and the, the unfortunate piece, especially in the startup world, is that as a security architect, it was always I, would, I can't tell you how many times you'd be like, hey, if you would have done, if you put security first when you're doing your design, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have all these security issues with your product. But unfortunately, in the world, especially with any investor in the room or if you're in a startup world, what's the most important thing when it comes to startup? Take, you know, after you take someone's money, you want to get to revenue. Right, and revenue is always the security. If anything's going to slow down that, that train to getting into the black, uh, it's just it's it's frowned upon. In the, at least in the VC industry, it's like, hey, if you build it in, and you have my project is going to take an extra six months because I got to figure out how to I got to find somebody who's certified as, as a understanding what secure software development best practices yeah. are, and then I got to refine all my code because you can have a great like the the guys in the parity team, and even I didn't even say Vitalik. He right? might be a great you know developer. But he doesn't follow any kind of security best practices, you know. And yeah, I've had more developers that have looked at Solidity and said it's pure crap. You know, why did they go create another programming language? So there's a lot of again, we're at the very beginning of this, I think. And so we can only hope that when it comes to secure software development best practices, you know, when you're doing your analysis of, of startups, you have to look at this. You know, for me, there's a, there's a new startup called Mas Masari. I don't know if you guys have heard of Masari, and uh, the, the, they're they're the new Edgars for I see it for for startups in the space, and what they're doing is they're doing the analysis of different companies, looking at the code, looking at the teams. Um, but it, it'd be great to see: do they have security architects and experts, programmers that can sit there and look at the code and say, did they follow the right best practice? Because I think in any industry that's new, you're going to get you know bad code. So you can like you can audit the auditors, but it's a brand new industry. How are you going to audit something that's that's four years old? You know, they don't get it. They may be super, you know, 256 IQ, this Vitalik has, that's great. But it doesn't mean he understands the value of following a process to secure your, your program. So it's, it's, you're never gonna, like they say, you're never gonna be 100% uh, uh, secure. But at least you can, when you're evaluating your investments and you're looking at your code and you're deciding, you know, what's your project team and your timeline, you have to factor in security because you're a blockchain company we're a wallet company saying, hey, we're going to have an unbreakable wallet, so we're going to spend a lot of money on auditing the hell out of our smart contracts. That way, when they're connecting to a secure enclave, whether it's an SGX or in the Microsoft uh, Enclave DB, the API and the code is solid. And we thought about that first. Right? So it's, it's, again, it's, and trust me, 90% of the VCs out here, unless it's a security investment, you know, they're not the first question out of their mouth is, you know, how, you know, what kind of security best practices you do around the development of code. You know, it's like, hey, show me the MV MVP. It's got nothing, it's, it's like it's an oxymoron when it comes to security. Minimum available product does not mean that it's going to be secure unless you're building your scripts. I can go forever. I'll let you talk this over. Uh, yeah, I think your point on startups not having enough time and having to be the investor is deadlines and expectations is a really true and good point. It's something I see often, so. So, yeah, so, okay. So, um, can, can I mention one thing? Yeah. yeah. When you're talking about revenues, that's the big driver for a lot of these things, revenue and time. So the revenue is, the, the investors are looking for the revenue from the product. They're pushing it out the door and they want to get the most features because they're looking for the most consumption. Um, but there's another way of pulling, pushing up um, revenue that's pushing down risk. Okay, there's a balance between risk and return that we often neglect. Now, risk is very easy to measure. All you have to do is identify your risk exposure, determine the probability it's gonna get you, and assess the consequences if it does. Those are very easy things to see. And if you're constantly pushed down on the risk, you can push up on revenue and then not sacrifice time. So these are some of the things that, that come out of the game, since the, the new incentives start favoring these different ways of valuation. So this is, um, again, we're not, the, the, we want the software engineers to come back to their tribe of physical space engineers, the civils and the mechanicals and electricals. That's one of my missions, is to come here and say, come on guys, come back with us. We, we're, we're a tribe, we, we can solve these problems together. Um, and it, 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 that's why it's, it's, it's a good, it's a very good to be here. I'm glad that you invited me. 
But I just want to add that one piece that we're looking at risk as opposed to return. So, um, so we know like blockchain itself is, uh, you know, lots of discussion, you know, in ventures, in, you know, uh, research people and in the developers have been discussing about uh, stability, has been discussing about uh, decentralization and also like uh, security. So we know uh, there are lots of uh, solutions right now uh, in the stability space. So for example, uh, on the on-chain, Side, we have a sharding. We have a sharding, we have multi chain solutions. So they have projects like Zilliqa, you know, like Pop Chain. So they have a main, you know, chain and with other child chains as well. And uh, for the off chain solutions, we have a Bitcoin Lightning Network. So they have a state channel, they have sub chain solutions. So um, I, I also see lots of uh, projects doing the off chain and on chain solutions for security. Um, but I, um, I was wondering what's the, what's the technology and what's the direction of this area and how this on-chain and off-chain interact, interact and the differentiate to some extent. I mean, a lot of the, so the scaling issues, and I think I, I talked about this, is like, I don't particularly care. I, I mean, I want this to be fast, I want it to work, so sharding, Casper and all the shit that they're doing, it's important. And this is where we're at. It's like, hey, it needs to be faster, it needs to be more secure, it needs to interoperate with everything, right? But I think that when you do, when you talk talking about, like I, I was just doing an efficient, uh, you know, doing a design for for a blockchain project for a business. Uh, I think a lot of times, a lot of companies I talk to, you, they're like, hey, we're just going to do a private blockchain because it's going to be private and secure. What they don't realize is that an architect, blockchain architecture, now and in the future is going to be a combination of both public and private. So, and it's going to be, you know, not public blockchains, private blockchains, along with um, Web 2.0 infrastructure doing a ton of off-chain processing, right? Because today, you can't do, you want to 15 second transactions or Ethereum, uh, and so you have to have an architecture, right, that's going to interrupt, you know, doing cross-chain, like we're talking about being able to do smart contracts between two different chains, like Hyperion versus, and, and, uh, and Ethereum. So, it, how are you going to secure all that? You know, how do you know the smart contract that was written in, in uh, chain code is going to be do anything? Uh, first of all, is it going to work? Second of all, how, how do you ensure the security of, of, of this group, so this chain smart contracts was found? So, to me, the answer to that question come, always comes down to the basic principles of security when it comes to, you know, when you, when you have people on your team and you start looking at your best practice, not just software development, you know, how are you doing your defense and death strategy? You know, if I'm going to interoperate with some other chain, I can sit there and look at the smart contract security, but also what kind of, you know, it's, it's like compliance when you're dealing with your partners. You know, you're only as strong as your weakest link. That, that applies in this whole space. So I can design a great one single private blockchain network, right, with some partners. And then we go to them, all right, if we want to verify your transactions, why don't we verify them on a public blockchain but they're there forever. Um, and then, you know, let's go look at your, all your nodes because I know, I guarantee, your supply chain partners, that small little supply chain in the Philippines, you know, I guarantee they haven't spent the money on, on security data in their servers. So you have to follow, again, this, this is all old hat basic advice, which is if you don't follow security, security best practices at every single layer, from your policy down to the, to the edge, uh, you're going to get burned, I mean, period. And there's no way, there's no easy answer for security. You just have to follow what's out there. You have to have certified people, and, and you got to always think about how am I going to do this right. Yeah, I'll focus on the uh, um, scalability. So we're we're like in a four three state, one to five, like build a uh, public blockchain. Like I'm just speaking to public blockchain, just for simple be simple. So one to five, like build the chain from from zero, and six to ten, like do layer two, like network, right? So we got thunder plasma like network. Uh, yeah, you just need to. We don't have a winner. You just need to put your chips on the table. I bet on the, the solution that you like, bet your Bitcoin on it. Yeah, so uh, interesting. So uh, the project I, I am incubating is called PlayBlock. They are public blockchain for games. Uh, what they have done is they, they, they have been working with the Tsinghua University Top Academy in China and using their consensus algorithm from the lab, have been testing and verifying it in the real world. So the consensus algorithm is like theoretically and practically verified. 
and they are sure that this is faster than the U.S. So the team like spend their own money, uh, bootstrap it, and uh, just build the, the public blockchain from the ground up. Uh, yeah, so they are they choose to build their own chain, um, but we also have other solutions, the cost models, you know, like uh, for the apps for the apps to build on. So I think uh, we don't have a winner yet. But I don't think there's going to be a winner. But that's the biggest misconception. I'm sorry, is that there's going to be some one blockchain that will not. That to me is complete bullshit <coughs> because it is like the internet. You can have you're going to have multiple blockchains. You're not going to have you can have you know have different public. There'll be an Ethereum. There will be many public blockchains, and you'll have a lot of private blockchains. And the internet right now, there's not one owner of the whole internet. It's a series of many different companies that connect with standard protocols. And that I think is that you'll have blockchains that will be fast, that will be interoperable, that will communicate with each other. But the focus. Is going to be is you're going to have the, the protocols that run across these different mm -hmm. chains will be the ones that have to be. Yeah, secure. yeah, but we're talking about like a performance, right? Oh. Security. Yeah, there, there got to be one chain faster than the others. I'm talking about this. Yeah. Uh, but a uh, uh, different situation, a different use case, right? You, you might want to use like this one is faster in public blockchain, but that one might be private faster yeah. and have different use cases. Yeah, but, I, but I agree, like a different scope, like different domain have different chains. Domain. No, for sure. I mean, if you want to make money, again, it's with the VCs I talk to, all of them like this one model saying, show me how you can make money today. Okay, I want to see money. Is it, can you make money in six months? Twelve months? Great. We'll give you money. Most, most startups don't have that answer. They haven't figured it out. And a lot of them, they, and in this space, it's great because they play in the protocol. Like, well, we're going to have Casper for another two years, or, you know, EOS is still being, you know, still you know, figuring it out. So it's, it is. It's, then, then the race is, all right, well, which blockchain is going to rule them all? Right now, yeah, that's a good question, and you know, and you have to look at them and say, what are those capabilities today? How fast are you? How interoperable are you? You know, is EOS all that, or is it, you know, is it a, is it a combination of blockchains? Who knows? But again, so if you want to make money today, then the answer is definitely you can evaluate, hire somebody that knows this change. But in the future, I really don't think it's going to be. Yeah. So I think uh, most security vulnerabilities occur. At the point of interaction between the user and the blockchain, and I think this is well illustrated. Um, before I worked with Draper, I was working on the Enigma project with their ICO, and what happened with their ICO is the CEO's email got hacked, and then through that they were able to change the public address to which people were paying tokens into for the sale into their own, and so through that they were able to capture about six hundred thousand dollars worth of you know, raised funds, and so that's not a problem with Ethereum. It's, it's, it's making that interaction point secure. And I think that's a huge problem the industry will have to face while still maintaining, while still making it easy enough that people will actually use blockchain to begin with. So I think um, it would be cool to see how that plays out. Well, that's similar to the example we just did with the handshake. That's the in interfacing where we're placing, uh, so we're on a, um, a delegated proof of stakes um, uh, blockchain. We use the blockchain differently. Uh, instead of you know, using it to hold and contain things. We use it like a big metronome. So it's like a, a time function. So we get, it synchronizes all the events that are being placed on the blockchain. And as a time function, you can now do um, quantitative analysis to it. You can use differential calculus because you've got something changing with the rate of change of time. So that gives you tremendous abilities to analyze situations. So this is how we're just using it differently. And as we're, we're using um, risk, we're quantifying risk. So there's really nothing to steal. What are you going to steal? This risk number, this probability statistic, and, and then it gets it, it gets converted to money somewhere else in somebody else's blockchain. But as far as ours is concerned, is you know you, you have to secure it, but it, it's it's not the um, it's not the end of the world. But absolutely, it's going to be that interface that in between the banker and the insurance company, between the insurance company and the owner, between the owner and the construction company, between the construction company and the subcontractor, all those points of interchange where you can transfer risk from one party to another are perfect and classic applications for uh, a, a smart contract or, or adjudicated smart contract by a distributed uh, body of knowledge. Yeah, just a, just a quick second point that I think is interesting is that how, how Legality plays into all of this. For example, with the, with the DAO attack, right? The attacker didn't do anything illegal. He was just exploiting an existing loophole in Ethereum for his own profit. And so some people argue that because the Ethereum Foundation chose to hard fork and get rid of his funds, that he should sue the Ethereum Foundation. 
because he never did anything wrong. So I think that's a, I think with these decentralized systems, it'll be interesting to see how people are able to tackle that issue. Well, well, code, code is law is an extremely dangerous thing. Uh, Do not get sucked into that. No, but you have oh to, my God. I, Gravity, I, mass, impact, electricity, heat, fire, those are law. Okay, I could take a Turing machine, throw it down a flight of stairs, guarantee it'll crash. I mean, yeah, this I, is, don't get sucked into that. No, no, look, like, I understand the DAO, the whole concept of decentralized autonomous organizations um, is definitely, it's a beautiful concept, but you need to have governance. That's, I mean, that's the whole thing. Blockchain is built off of communities, communities about people, and, and, you, and the whole word consensus is about working well together. So when you're doing security, you have to have a good government. I, I launched a nonprofit, and we're building blockchain networks for social impact. And uh, when we're done with this, at the same time, in parallel, we're building a governance board of nonprofits to be able to, because we have uh, automated machines that are going to be scanning highways and, and collecting public information. So you go to North Carolina, they have 540 cameras. We're going to be scanning everybody for illicit uh, behavior that sex predator maybe kidnapped your kid and put them in the trunk. So we're going to be scanning those cars, but we have to ensure privacy. So we have a DAO bot, a compliance bot, that's going to automatically destroying that video content, right? And, and then we, we store the transaction verification on blockchain. But I can't automate the bot completely. I need to have a governance board that sits there and says, okay, when do we want to update the bot and policies? Because that's the other thing, is that if you're going to have any kind of DAO type environment, you know, trust the computer, this, this is, look, Web 4.0, who here knows what Web 4.0 is? That's probably a nightmare for you. Because Web 4.0 is all this blockchain stuff, but now you're automating it. You got you know, Elon Musk with blockchain underneath it. You know, auto, everything is, gets automated, and you have, you know, Jetsons, basically. That whole future is what Web, Web 4.0 is. You know, and if you don't have good governance and good security, good privacy, forget about it. You will have, you know, Skynet. Very exciting to start. Uh, we have limited time, so one or two minutes. Uh, one last question. Uh, we see lots of technology today, like uh, zero knowledge proofs, homomorphic encryption, and also like today we see like uh, for the zero blog and also for the anchor they use like, Intel SGX. Like, so what do you think the future of technology? For this case? Uh, I'm all for encrypting, using any of these new like zero knowledge proofs or homomorphic encryption. Um, when you're doing, look at Zcash. Zcash uses zero knowledge proof to shield transactions on the blockchain. Great. So now you have a blockchain that can actually, you can, the transactions are not pseudonymous, right? That they are uh, you know, Bitcoin or Block or Ethereum. But uh, you still, the encryption is great, but I will never ever agree with um, storing PII and encrypting it on a blockchain. You know, it's like imagine having your, your electronic medical records and, and using blockchains to secure your records, so you're in control of uh, your, your own uh, medical records, great idea. But that information shouldn't be encrypted on a blockchain. It's just not, you know, it's again, because it, here's, the, here's the, the scenario goes, is that if I go and encrypt it and put it on a blockchain, right, um, it's encrypted, great. But if I'm gonna, and the only way that you can get that to that data, because it's on a business blockchain, for example, um, is that, hey, I'm a business partner and, and I'm good, but what if somebody hacks the chain, gets a copy of that encrypted block of data, and then says, I don't care if I get kicked off the blockchain, because that's the whole premise around if you get 51% that the, that the blockchain community will find you and then kick you off so you can no longer do a transaction on the network. A hacker's not going to give a shit. A hacker's going to say, hey, I've got, uh, got all these electronic medical records or finance records. It's encrypted on a blockchain, yet they use zero knowledge proof or home of encryption. Great. I'm going to take it. I'm going to go back to my house. and I'm going to crack it open, and then I'll get to the data. So you should, not, in my humble opinion, never store you know, you can encrypt on the chain, you know, you should, I mean, Quorum is cool because it's using an Ethereum co code base. Quorum is the blockchain that uh, GP Morgan Chase built. Um, they have got an Ethereum code base, and they use uh, the zero, Zcash um, algorithm te technology to do encrypted trans, I mean, it's a shield transaction. It's not actually encrypted payload, but at least when it transmits, it's over. So Quorum is a great blockchain uh, because it's, you know, it's got, you can make smart contracts, and it's using uh, encryption on the chain, but I still would never in a million years use, and you talk, you talk to Amber about that, or anybody in the financial services industry who are building these uh, financial services blockchains, none of them are, 
or throwing any kind of PII with these encryption um, programs on chain. It's just don't do it. So my current focus is on uh, how the layer two protocol. Uh, how do we guarantee that layer two protocol is talking to the major ecosystem correctly? Yeah, interoperability. Yeah, interoperability, like security of interoperability. So I think from the investment angle, for us, what we look at is wallet to values. Kind of for the reason that I talked about before, which is that point that which the user interacts with the blockchain. So we're investors in Ledger, of course, and we're looking at other wallets that do interesting things to make it easy and secure to send transactions on the blockchain. And so that's kind of what we're focusing on. Well, our advice as masters of the physical world, do not lose the human element. The best decryptor, the best encryptor in the world is still a human being. And do not lose fact that all of this is a representation of a human condition. Um, there's going to be mechanization and there's going to be jobs lost to blockchain. Well, those people now have to be elevated to the next state, a higher state above blockchain, the adjudication of these states that the blockchain is articulating. So that is our, that's what the engineers are telling me right now. Do that and we'll be okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the limited time, we have to welcome Alex Witt, uh, CFO of SWIFT, for his next presentation. Thanks for taking those are big risks.